You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, David. Hello, Will. And hello, listeners. Welcome to episode three of Kai June. Kai June. And today we have we will be continuing the series that is filling up our month of June, where we are talking about kaiju movies and concepts and how they pertain to our realm of science. Uh, you've already listened to a few episodes, hopefully. This one will be a little bit different, but we are still going to be using this to not critique movies but investigate how they portray and represent and treat science. How does this fall into the category of science and entertainment overlap? We will be discussing this episode a little bit of a different topic. This is kind of going to be your intermission for the series. Yes, we did King Kong and Godzilla. Yep. Little intermission and foreshadowing more King Kong and Godzilla to come. Oh boy. For this episode, as you notice from the title, this is going to be kaiju concepts. We're not going to be talking about a singular movie. We're going to be talking about kaiju themes, you know, going through some of the science behind just the topic in general, the history of the topic in general. Uh, but we will be using some movies as our platforms of example and discussion. The two movies we'll be using for this episode are Cloverfield and Pacific Rim. Cloverfield directed by Matt Reeves in 2008 and put out by Paramount Pictures, and Pacific Rim by Guillermo del Toro in 2013 by Warner Brothers Pictures. We'll be leaning a bit more on Pacific Rim for the episode because uh, we did get a suggestion to discuss Pacific Rim by one of our listeners, so a shout out to Ed. Thanks, Ed. We will definitely be going a little more in detail to that movie, and there's lots to talk about within that movie, so that'll be fun. So we'll hit on Pacific Rim and Cloverfield as sort of our examples for kaiju concepts. We'll mention other movies, but we're going to drop the spoiler warning for Pacific Rim and Cloverfield. Absolutely. We, we should be able to avoid spoilers for any others, but as always, you have been warned there will be spoilers. We can't discuss the movies without them. Yes. Turn back now. All ye who enter here. Yes. So to begin things, I thought we should actually go ahead and define what a kaiju is. Yeah, we've been talking about it. You, yes. Yet, yet at this point, you've picked up that King Kong is one and Godzilla is one. Absolutely. And nowadays, kaiju is a pretty common term. That's actually because of Pacific Rim for us over here across the sea. Yeah. Like, kaiju was a fairly strictly Japanese or at least Indo-Pacific term. Now we all know kaiju fairly well, uh, but kaiju has a long history, and it is your giant monsters. That That's what it refers to. It's not a complex term, really, but it does have a very unique history than what you might expect it to. So originally, kaiju referred to creatures and monsters from Japanese myth and legend. You know, so this was not, you know, it was before movies, so it was not a movie term yet, and it was a much looser term. Is just for monsters. It, it was like, it's like the term cryptid we discussed in the cryptozoology episode. Just mysterious, weird creatures. Yes. And that's what it originally meant. The first time the word appears historically is in the written uh, uh, story of Classic of Mountains and Seas, which was a Chinese story written as early, at least as the 4th century BC. Wow. That's at least the oldest copy that I was able to see that they had found. So kaiju goes back a long, long way. Yeah, thousands of years. Very, very long time. After Sokoku, which is a, for, a, a foreign policy in Japan that was basically did not allow outsiders in or people out of Japan for quite a time. It literally meant country in chains. When this ended was when the the term kaiju was able to start moving out and being used for wider topics and more broader conversations. One of which is it was used to explain cryptids, but also 
certain things in paleontology. Oh, cool. Yeah. There's at least one story in 1908 during the Meiji period where it was suggested that the extinct Ceratosaurus, one of my favorite dinosaurs, yeah. this is the one with the, the little, not quite horns, but little bumps on the nose and eyebrows, little spikes, predatory dinosaur, was still alive in Alaska, and it was referred to as a kaiju. Interesting. Also, fun historical note, Ceratosaurus, to my knowledge, the first dinosaur depicted in live action and film. True. We'll talk about that someday. Oh, yes. We'll do a little history oh, yes. uh, someday. And so it, it actually already had a connection to paleontology, which I found very interesting. That's fun. Is dinosaurs were already being referred to as kaiju, as, as big monsters. Nice. It wasn't until our... It wasn't until 1953 that we got our more traditional view of kaiju, which did very much start in film. So our our nowadays mentality of oversized monsters is a film concept of kaiju. And the first movie to have it in the title, now it was an American movie, so it didn't have it in the American title, is The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. Very famous movie. 1953, before Godzilla... Mm -hmm. um in its original release so it's this is actually arguably the original kaiju we're not going to discuss this movie here because it actually has a whole bunch of other stuff we can discuss and we can't we can't not spend a whole discussion on it yeah. so someday someday but in japan it is genshi kaiju ga arawareru but this is the first movie where kaiju was in the title was used for film so this is the beginning of the history, though many consider Godzilla to be the first kaiju film, like for the genre. Okay. If that makes sense. Okay. So it's not a you know clean cut history, but this is where the term came from. And since then, that's kaiju has been what we've we now know it as, you know, so for 50 years now, it's been big movie monsters. And that's interesting because it means that King Kong, mm -hmm. the original King Kong, as we discussed, predates the term kaiju really coming into use in film. Which is why it's such an odd, you know, and we discussed it briefly when we did King Kong, is technically it would be the first kaiju movie by our nowadays understanding of the genre, but the genre did not exist when king kong was made yes it was 20 years before its time so it it's kind of like uh you know there are things that if we went back through writings now we might call cyberpunk right know, but right. at the time they didn't have you know, or steampunk but at the time they didn't have that term so it wasn't classified as that so it's it's a retroactive addition to the kaiju list but officially as were intended to be kaiju films godzilla was the first in that genre, as that genre. Yes. Though this was the first one named, 20,000 Fathoms. So yeah, a, a interesting. I was very surprised when I was doing research that it started in film, as at least our modern understanding of it. Like, usually, when it comes to most things in film, it has a long literary history. But that it wasn't like a genre of writing, even though it was used in that story. It was just a term. Kind of like we call evil things demons. Yeah, you know, it's not like there's there's a specific, uh, you, you know, the term demon goes back throughout lots of history. It's kind of like that, where it was just a term for monsters. Yeah. And then, like you said, most I mean, kaiju is a foreign word. Yes. And mostly it remained that it was known mm -hmm. if you were in East Asia, you may have heard it. Japan, especially. And then it was something that you knew the word over here in America, if you were that kind of geek that yes. knew that stuff, and I say that with with all the endearment of the oh, world, as, of course, as Look who's those talking. kind of geeks for other stuff. But then Pacific Rim happened. Absolutely, it did. And Pacific Rim outright calls its monsters kaiju. Yeah, they're classified that way and uses it throughout the movie. Mm -hmm. So anyone who is kind of into this sort of thing that didn't know that term before now it's part of the lexicon in in a way that it's never been before in western culture which is wonderful because oh yes before pacific rim here in the u.s you just called them giant monster movies yes 
which is what they are, and that's effectively what kaiju movie that kaiju movie is saying the same thing, just yep. in, a, in a different with a different language Shorter. word. Yes, <laughs> with less with less letters. But it giant monster movie sounds dumber. <laughs> so very briefly, we should introduce our two star movies. Yes, and why they are kaiju films. Mm-hmm. So Pacific Rim, as we already mentioned, its giant monsters are labeled kaiju very overtly in the movie that's their classification yes and that is how they've been scientifically denoted in the world of pacific rim so that's obviously a kaiju movie and they are indeed giant building sized monsters cloverfield is uh one of those kaiju movies where like those zombie movies that never use the word zombie yeah you know they never call it what it is but it is a giant monster rampaging through new york and terrorizing things a little bit different than your average kaiju movie because it's from street level view the whole time and that's it was meant to give a a human eye view to the events yeah cloverfield for those who haven't seen it cloverfield is a movie that is a found footage movie yep it was in the heyday of those that film style it's a single camera being carried around by one of the main characters following this troop of characters harrowing adventures as Manhattan, New York, New York, is set upon mm-hmm. by a giant mysterious monster and the military shows up and these main characters are caught in the middle of it, running from place to place, occasionally interacting with both the military forces trying to stop the big monster and the big monster itself yes it was also a very unique movie because they did not advertise it as a kaiju film no that's jj abrams mystery box yes, thing exactly it was very very stealthy so that when you start it you can't tell it's that kind of movie until things start going wrong uh so that it's it that this is kind of a a stealth you know, addition to the category. Yes. And then Pacific Rim is very much the opposite. At almost as if it was on purpose. In all it, it all the advertising was there are giant robots and they fight giant monsters mm-hmm. and that's the pull. Pacific Rim is a movie that takes place in a basically post apocalyptic world. Yes. Where attacks by giant monsters have become so much the norm all over the planet that Governments around the world and militaries around the world have united to create the Jaeger program. The Jaegers are giant kaiju-sized robots that are piloted by humans. A better version of Rock'em Sock'em robots than the other movie that tried to do that. Yes. Or giant Iron Mans. Yep. Or Gundam, if you're Gundam. that kind of geek. Gundam. It's Gundam. And so the movie is basically humans in giant robot suits trying to figure out the best way to stop the kaiju that keep coming out of the ocean and destroying Mm -hmm. stuff. Cloverfield is very stealth, very found footage, very sort of, you don't see a lot of the monster. Pacific Rim is very action, almost dopey action in a lot of places. And it is in your face. You came here to watch giant robots punch monsters. Absolutely. And they both fall into the kaiju category in very different ways. Because whilst Pacific Rim is ridiculous, because of some of the choices it makes, it's actually more excusable in some oh, yeah. of the ways the kaiju work. <laughs> whilst while Cloverfield tries to be more realistic, it actually is more uh, um, uh, susceptible to the pitfalls of kaiju issues. And there are some universal kaiju issues. Scientifically. Scientifically speaking. So now on to the science. So... We all recognize that sci-fi is sci-fi for a reason. It is science fiction. Mm -hmm. Another word for fantasy. It is fantastical. It is beyond reality. And so we all recognize, yes, these are not possible. But why? Why are kaiju films not possible? You know, there's tons of things like, why can't a big robot, you know, okay, well, we don't have the technology to build that. That's, that one's pretty easy. You know, I don't ha- we don't have laser guns and we don't have all that. But why can't a kaiju exist? That's kind of the core question, at least for me. The core question to kaiju movies is why don't we see a Godzilla 
Like even our biggest animals don't come close to Godzilla. No. And the biggest dinosaurs were super impressive. Ridiculous. But Godzilla's, like, new Godzilla is what, 300 feet yes. tall? Yes. Yeah. Nothing like that. And it's like, that's, you know, that, that even puts blue whales, yep. to, like, to shame. In Pacific Rim, I forget what the number was, but they actually, at one point, they cite the weight mm-hmm. of one of the kaiju at, I think it was 200-something thousand tons. Exactly. Which is, a, a blue whale's, uh, like, 100 tons. Yeah, so it's, it is completely outside of any living thing why why so what's the science so there's one key pe- there's lots of reasons that you could go into as to the fact that well it's something that they eat yeah where's you know? it's getting it resources how how is it going to you know has it going to have a territory big enough if there's one there has to be more than one so how could a population of these fit on there's a lot of things like that but there's really one core issue and it is known as the square cube law. Mm-hmm. Now, you may or may not have heard of this law before, but this is what everyone's referring to when they talk about giant movie monsters collapsing under their own weight or suffocating under their own mass or not being able to stand up. This is the physics issue behind when you get too big. So what this is referring to is, and this doesn't, this is not intuitive necessarily right away because when you're working with small animals like us and cats and dogs and even things like horses, it's there, but it's not nearly as noticeable. But when you scale something in size, it does not scale one to one. You can't take something that's itty bitty and scale it up or something that's big and scale it down and it work the same way. Right. Yes, gravity accelerates everything at the same rate, but the physics of those sizes still still affects that animal differently. And the reason, the really weird reason, and this is something that it's hard to wrap your mind around because it doesn't seem like it should be true, but it is, is that your volume and your surface area do not increase at the same rate. No. So as things get bigger, their volume grows faster than their surface area. So that means if you took a you know one cup you know water measuring cup and then scaled it up to a hundred times it now holds a hundred cups the volume has scaled by a hundred but the surface area has not right so you can do this math yeah you know, some simple versions of this math with cubes because cubes are super fun to exactly deal with. yes if you have a meter cube and each side is a meter meter by a meter by a meter then you can calculate the surface area by calculating six squares on each side mm-hmm. of the cube. And you can calculate the volume by multiplying your length times width times height. If you, like you're in PowerPoint and you just scale it up. Yep, and keeping all the proportions. And double its size. So now it's a two meter cube. What you will find is that the size of the sides of the cube have doubled, the surface area has quadrupled, and the volume has increased eightfold. Yes. Your, to put it in very mathematical terms, your surface area increases by the square of your size increase, and your volume increases by the cube of it, the square cube law. And so that's that's the math behind it. And... Y- works very clearly on cubes it works on everything else too including animals yes now there's a lot of things that this affects in real life animals in normal wildlife there was one quote i found so there was one person who who brought this concept to biology in a big way it was uh jbs halding in the late 1800s to mid 1900s uh, who was a British Indian scientist, biologist, I believe, and or mathematical biologist, brought math into the study of biology and focused on this term or on this concept and how it affects animals. And there was one quote that I really liked, which was, an elephant cannot be mistaken for a mouse scaled up. No. And this, when an animal gets scaled, physics starts affecting it differently. And... This seems, because gravity is constant. We all learn this in basic science. Gravity is constant. It is, but it doesn't scale, which is counterintuitive, but it's true. This is why an elephant's legs are 
huge thick tree trunks while a mouse just has these teeny tiny little twigs oh, yeah. and an ant is just spindle legs and to give you an ex- with ants there's a reason that if i drop if i drop a cat off of a countertop cat's fine if i jump off of that countertop i might be fine depending on how fit i am and depending on how i land if an elephant makes too far of a step down like that it's almost certainly going to get injured and I can drop an ant from the Empire State Building and it cannot get hurt by landing because the air resistance is too great. Yep. So physics works differently. And the way to think about the... So the legs is a great example. Mm-hmm. And this this also works for muscle strength Absolutely. and things. The strength of a pillar, of a leg, of, of, of a support is going to be proportional generally to its cross section. Mm-hmm. So the... Th- length of a rope or the length of a pillar is nowhere near as important to the strength of it as how thick around it is and as that increases proportionally the volume of the thing it's holding is increasing faster than the area exactly because of the square cube law which means that your pillar has only increased by a little bit while the mass the pillar is trying to hold up has increased by a lot more. So an ant's legs scaled up to a hundred times, a thousand times, cannot hold the mass, the volume that is included inside of that ant. This is also why in living animals, as animals get bigger, even in their life, from baby to adult, yes. their proportions, their body proportions, don't scale exactly. If you go from a tiny little baby, dinosaur or elephant, to a very big version, your legs, for example, are likely to get proportionally thicker, increasing faster than the rest of the body is growing, so that they can accommodate that exponential growth in the weight. This is the same reason why it's so difficult to build taller and taller and taller skyscrapers. Because the amount of building you're fitting inside is increasing faster than the height of the building. And it becomes, physics-wise, very difficult. So Godzilla, mm-hmm. or the kaiju in, Clo- in, in, in Pacific Rim, or whatever Cloverfield's name was. Clover. Just Clover? Yeah, just Clover. Clover. Are hundreds of thousands of tons, and at that point, there is no way that... Any limb that is recognizable as a regularly shaped limb is going to be big enough to be strong enough to hold that weight. Absolutely. And even with things, you know, some of you might be thinking, especially in, you know, the new and more recent Godzilla designs, they have big, thick legs. Yes, but still, that's not, not, so, we're now, even with those big legs, even if those could hold up the body, you still have to now move them. With your muscles. That is, and to move that much leg takes a lot of muscle, which adds a lot of weight, which takes yes. more muscle. Which It's, it's the spaceship problem. Yep. Yeah. Your Just, fuel. Incidentally, this also goes for wings. Absolutely it does. This is a big reason why birds can only get so big, why your big flying kaiju are liable to be impossible, because the bigger your body gets, your wings have to get much, 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 much larger in order to carry that weight. Mm-hmm. And eventually you reach a point where a wing just won't function anymore. It's too big or your weight is too much for any reasonable wing to be able to do it. And if you were to keep isometric scaling, which means you stay the exact same shape as you get bigger. Proportional. Proportional scaling. If a bird, for instance, was scaled up to the size of uh, dragons from Game of Thrones and the wings were the same size and the body was the same size, they would have to fly faster and faster and faster to create enough lift. If your wings don't get bigger, your speed has to increase. So going from a seagull that you know flies lazily around, they'd be having to fly at you know jet speeds at giant sizes to maintain enough lift like our planes do. <laughs> you need to create a <laughs> lot of lift, and the only way you can do that, up to a point, is faster speeds. So this is why, and it's why giant insects don't work. Yep. It's also why ants are so, quote-unquote, strong. Yes, exactly. Because 
yes, they can lift, and to put it very, very simply, yes, an ant can lift a hundred times its own weight, but that's because a hundred times its own weight is very, very, very small, and it's easy to lift, whereas an elephant would be lucky if it could move its own weight Absolutely. times one. I mean, just to practice that out, go try to pick someone out, someone up that's your same size. Yep. Uh, don't actually do that if you're going to throw your back out, but you get the concept. Like if you were to pick yourself up, that's a lot of weight. That's a, it's hard to pick up your own weight. So the basic, the underline here is Kaiju. That is beyond what biologically is physically possible. It's just the physics of at least our universe. Don't allow for something based on earth biology Mm -hmm. to get that big. Now, As we said, and as we always reiterate in our silver screen science, that's not to say that we don't like them. In fact, the fact that they're impossible makes it that much more fun to go watch them in movies. That's why I want to go see them. I want to go see something that can't happen. That'd be (laughs) awesome. It's very interesting. I once saw a documentary that made the strength comparison very nicely. It was uh, Animal Olympics. And they did all the normal Olympic things, high jump, long jump, you know, the dashes and the marathons and all sorts of stuff. They did the weightlifting session. And one of the things they did with all the animals is they scaled them to the same size. And it was, instead of countries, it was uh, arthropods, reptiles, mammals, birds, uh, and fish. And the, they would take the, you know, the classic strongest of each one for the weightlifting of the fastest of each one and then compare them. And the ant did extremely well, you know, scaled up for what the weight challenges would be. But when the elephant was scaled down, it was actually very unimpressive. Oh yeah. Because the only reason elephants are impressive is because they're big. Yes. And that's, that's the concept is what seems to make sense and what looks normal the you know the example I would use is if you scale the cat up to an elephant size, it would look weird. Oh yeah, its legs would be too thin. Yeah, it'd be a weird shape, and it would fall apart. It'd be the same way, thing as if you found a mouse that was proportioned like an elephant with little pillar legs and just shaped like a rectangle. Yeah, that's that's weird. Why are you so blocky? Yeah. Now this concept factors into all the kaiju movies we're discussing, but for these two, there's kind of an interesting dynamic. So. In Cloverfield, we are not given an origin for Clover specifically. This is this is a end of movie spoiler. So if you don't want to hear it, yeah, spoil- se- spoilers start now. This is and this is like this is a big this is one of the weird big spoilers. So the spoiler at the very end of the movie, if you watch closely, the whole thing is they're recording a camera and there's previous recording on it. At the very end, you see a scene from like a week earlier before the movie, and they're at uh, Coney Island. On the Ferris wheel, and in the distance, you see something fall out of space into the water. Or Mm -hmm. out of the sky, at least. Yeah. And that is supposed to be connected to the monster emerging a week later. Yes. I think, if I remember right, the original concept, at least through interviews, is that that's supposed to be like a down satellite that falls and awakens Clover. You know, disrupts it from beneath the ocean. But we're never told. So, I mean, who knows? Maybe it's a spaceship that delivers Clover. Maybe it's something else weird. Yeah. But something falls down. Clover emerges from the ocean. There's also, and this is never said in the movie, Clover's supposed to be a juvenile? That's supposed to be, and the whole concept is just a lost baby. Mm-hmm. And this is how terrifying a big animal would be, even if it wasn't malicious. But the at least suggestions of the movie, you know, once again, none of this is stated, so we can all interpret it however we <laughs> we want. We can only assume. But is that it came from the ocean. Yes. As most kaiju do. Yep. Godzilla comes from the ocean. 20,000 fathoms came from the ocean. Pacific Rim, that's the whole thing, is that they come up out of the... Now, yep. granted, there's more to it in Pacific yes, Rim. Yes, which we'll mention in a second. But it's still following this trope that these giant creatures come from the ocean. And there's a couple issues with that. Because one of the things that the Square Cube Law is interesting on is it really really restricts land animals yes not nearly as much so sea animals no you're surrounded by water and it helps hold you up you have basically an anti-gravity bubble around you at all times this is why a blue whale can do just fine in the ocean but if it beaches 
is a death sentence. It's going to collapse. It can't support its own weight. It can't breathe properly. That's physics has caught up with it. Yes, it is. It is left its realm into one that is deadly for it. So if this is an animal functioning in the ocean, then it should not be able to hold up its weight nearly as well on land. And even with animals that do transition, you watch a sea lion swim versus when it's on land and you tell me that it does equally well in both areas <laughs> you watch an alligator yep swim and then move on land and you tell me that they're equally capable in both areas. it's there are things that you're allowed to do in the water that you're just not allowed to do on land the trope of kaiju coming from the ocean is really interesting for two reasons one is presumably there is that thought that 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 mentality of giant things live in the ocean yes Throughout all of Earth history, consistently the biggest creatures on the planet have always been in the ocean. The Kraken, Leviathan. Even in real life, mm-hmm. right? The marine reptiles of the Mesozoic were bigger than the dinosaurs. Absolutely. And whales today are as big as it gets. So it makes biological, you know, it, it sends to, to see that inspiration of, oh, well, if a giant creature is going to come from anywhere, it'll be the ocean. The other thing that I really like about the ocean origin trope is, and in Godzilla this is said explicitly, that a lot of kaiju are often invoking primordial beings. Yes. Ancient ancestral creatures building upon the facts of evolutionary history that life began in the oceans. Yes, absolutely. It also pulls very heavily from... The fact that we are entranced by the mystery of the sea because, A, we're not from it, so Mm. we are always uncomfortable in it. But we don't know what's down there. Like, we still don't understand it as well as we do things like the moon. And we're constantly finding new stuff, and you can't see the bottom. No. Well, and this is where you get Godzilla, the Meg pulled on this trope, and it's that, that... Who knows what could be down there? We can't see all of it. I've actually had discussions with people before when it came to discussing these topics, you know, for for training people that, you know, the fact that who knows what could be down there does not mean anything is down there. No. Just, yeah, there's a lot that could be down there, but there's also a lot that won't be. Yes. For more on that, uh, Silver Screen Science, the Meg, we talked about it. And... (laughs) The kaiju pull from that very heavily. My big beef with it is, and it's not always stated, but it's at least the vibe I got from watching Cloverfield. So kaiju are typically like immune to our weapons, you know, to some extent. Clover seems completely unfazed. We don't even see it get injured. It is spotless throughout the whole movie from any even bruise. And there's often this concept that you know deep sea creatures must be tougher because it's an inhospitable environment for us right it's and the, the, the pressure is so great exactly they they are they're tough they're able to withstand pressure and impact well it's the same fascination we end up getting with water bears and cockroaches in that like if they can survive something we can't survive they must be ridiculously tough okay well we're, first off we're not that tough so let's no. stop pretending like that's a a bar to measure by <laughs> and also you can still step on a cockroach like surviving you know constant surviving radiation blasts not constant radiation right they're not going to survive salt fallout that's a whole other discussion but surviving certain things does not mean you can survive anything yeah and also for any of you who are aware when you're down at the bottom of the ocean you're not tough you're squishy yep Deep sea animals are incredibly delicate. There's a reason that we've never had a deep sea anglerfish in human care because I've talked to my aquarium buddies and they've said that when they've tried, if they even touch the side of the net, they just fall apart. Yeah. They just tear because they're almost the consistency of the water. And if you do want to bring a deep sea animal up, you either have to put them in a put them in a pressurized canister that's going to slowly depressurize them like, you know, uh, a curing someone of the bends who surface too quickly while diving or you have to move them up the water column a few hours at a time stopping at different depths so an animal coming up from you know the bottom of the ocean would literally explode whilst raising up in pressure but also would be like punching jello 
Yep. So this concept that like deep sea animals are surviving in an area that we can't, therefore they must be hugely tough, is is just so far backwards that it's kind of funny. And that's a trend with kaiju as well, is Indeed. this notion that they persist in the most extreme, dangerous environments. They're often associated with the deep sea. And not just the deep sea, but like Pacific Rim does this where it's ocean trenches. As deep as it gets. As deep as it gets. Volcanoes are often invoked. And and it's, it's this notion that they... Kai, kaiju are often... This is particularly the case with things like Godzilla invoked as forces of nature more so than biological organisms absolutely and they operate under very sort of mythological rules yeah they are they are um you know greek myth monsters yes this is this is the beast of the mountains and the beast of the depth uh but it's it's an interesting concept that i've always found unique now pacific rim sidestepped this slightly because one of the things that's different with Pacific Rim, and here's another big spoiler. Because oh, like, yes. we're going to discuss the whole movies, but these are the two like twists in the movies that I'm talking about. So once again, tune out now. Save yourself. The kaiju in Pacific Rim are not natural. Nope. They are bio weapons. They are basically bio mechs. They're giant monsters designed by a interdimensional alien race to wipe out humanity. So their purpose is to survive at the depths and come ashore and fight us. Which, kind, it doesn't quite get them out of the physics rules. Mm-hmm. Those you're, you're in our dimension now. Our physics should still apply. But all those other biological things, I can't really judge because you're from another dimension and you were designed to do this. And that's sort of where kaiju... So we, we talk about our, one of our favorite topics, monsterification where movies will take real animals and then make them movie-worthy by turning them into monsters, Mm -hmm. by giving them traits that make less sense as real animals and more sense as movie monsters. And kaiju have never bothered me as much in the realm of monsterification because compared to something like Jurassic Park, where the films, especially the later films, are very much saying, look, dinosaurs just like in the museum and then just turning them into monsters kaiju films tend not to pretend that they're not monster movies they tend to be very overt with just these are big monsters the biological rules are kind of out the window and it makes them much more fantasy which kind of makes the the monsterification less egregious when and at that point it's not you know, even technically monsterification, because you're not monsterifying anything, you're making a monster. Yeah, just a monster. Like, you know, there was nothing to start with that you are now uh, 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 disgracing. Because that, whilst Jaws was a kaiju shark monsterified <laughs> from what actual sharks are, and has done horrible damage to the reputation and conservation of sharks. Yeah. There's no... Godzilla conservation agency because there's no Godzilla so it is a monster it was meant to be a monster and that's Pacific Rim leans into that even more than all the rest yeah because all the rest try to have like a all right here's where it might have come from Pacific Rim's like nope aliens aliens did it aliens monsters robots these are weaponized monsters from another world and you see that because now Clover and Cloverfield is by no means your classic kaiju. Very alien in design, which is why I actually would prefer the it's from space story. Because then, once again, now you can break a lot more rules. It's alien biology. Who knows what it's skin made out of? Yep. It's silicon based. Oh, blah, blah, blah. But it's got a very weird design to it. But all the rest of the kaiju, King Kong and Godzilla, they're just big animals. You know, big goofy versions of the animals, but big animals. The kaiju in Pacific Rim have axes on their face. One of them is called Knife Head. They have weapons built into them because they are meant to do battle. And it's they really lean into that. These are monsters. Which, all those other explanations of, okay, well then what were you eating? You weren't. You're not here to eat. So it's, it's a nice way to get around a lot of that. Which, as a scientist, I appreciate it. Because it 
turned off a big part of that brain, you know, that part of my brain while watching it. But also it is, I always cringe a little bit when movies try too hard to explain something, but you can't. Like, a kaiju is unexplainable. It is physically impossible. So you can't, I'll appreciate some effort, but you will always eventually hit that wall. And the harder you try, the sillier it becomes for me. And Pacific Rim went the opposite direction, which is interesting. So some of the interesting things, and part of the reason I we picked these two movies for this episode, is there are some little interesting connections between the two. My favorite that both of these movies do, which is a really interesting point of view for kaiju, is parasites. Kaiju parasites. Yeah. Ectoparasites. Which is fantastic. Almost all animals have ectoparasites. So ectoparasites are the ones that hang on your skin, not in your belly. Yes. These are ticks and mosquitoes and mites and all sorts of other weird things like that. Both Clover and the kaiju in Pacific Rim have ectoparasites. In Clover, they're very interesting because they're like these multi-limbed spider wolves. Yeah, and they're also predatory. Yes, which is that the the example to give there is this would be like if a flea jumped off your dog to, to then go hunt down other insects. Yes. And chase them, which is not wholly impossible. There are definitely animals that parasitize off of multiple creatures, but switching from parasitism to predation is a bit weird and extreme. It makes me wonder what parasites on Clover they were hunting. Yes, exactly. That there could be a whole ecosystem living on this creature. There's some big tick that's human-sized yeah. that hangs on Clover, and these are crawling around Clover to eat it, and then it saw all of us. That's a good way to think of it. Yeah. They also, though, have some weird um, venom or toxin in their bite. Yeah, it's not fully explained. But it causes you to pop, so it's bad. Yeah. Or they pop the it wasn't very clear yes we don't get a full ex explanation but there's definitely some side effects whether it's a venom or whether it's microbes in their you know the, a, a foreign biosphere in their saliva that causes sickness or something once again is it from the bottom of the ocean or is it from space but that one's cool the kaiju and pacific rim have uh have skin lice Yes. Which is what they call them in the movie, and they're, they're like these isopods, yeah, with a little puppy bug face, uh, and they're this these skin parasites that come off the kaiju, and they they even give them some biology that usually they die after the kaiju dies, but if you soak them in ammonia, they can survive. So like referencing that alien biology, which was cool, yeah, and the fact that most oftentimes parasites can survive outside their host, which absolutely. Is the the notion of exploring the microbiome and the and the 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 ecosystem that would form on and around a kaiju is fascinating and we've not in, in Godzilla there was the trilobite that presumably came off of Godzilla or something yeah whether by accident or whether it was hanging on there's a connection there but the question of like what lives on a kaiju and what lives in a kaiju and what happens when a kaiju dies? Yes. Is there a whole whale fall thing that goes on where it creates, inst you know, a whale fall creates a little short-lived ecosystem. Mm -hmm. When a kaiju dies, would it just spawn a forest? <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, and that's, yeah. in Pacific Rim, they kind of do because cities end up being built around the skeletons of kaiju, harvesting the kaiju for medicinal and commercial goods. Yep. They also talk about something called kaiju blue, which is a, a toxic off spill from the blood of the kaiju into the ecosystem. Right, right. They never say what the side effects are, but it's evidently like an oil spill. It's supposed to be really bad. Fascinating. Which is, once again, that's a very cool concept of like, you know, if I, if I were to fall and die in a well, I would poison that well. Yep. For drinking water. It makes sense that a massive animal the size of a building would poison a coastline. With its rotting carcass, which was very, I, I like that they went into those those side effects. Yeah, the kaiju are intrinsically abiological. They don't work biologically, but having accepted that, 
exploring some of the cool biological connections is really fun. Absolutely. Now, I do have one question here, because if, if the Pacific Rim Kaiju were built to be weapons, are the lice just, like, infesting the laboratory where they're built? Or, like, where are the lice coming from? That's My <laughs> guess is that it would. it's like when we have to try to sterilize things before we send them to Mars. Exactly. It's just the aliens are over there going, we just can't get rid of all the parasites. You just It's impossible to exterminate all of them. Yeah, it's like if you just are in a room... And you, you take a little bit of dust. Yeah, there's going to be dust mites. There's yep. dust mites around us all the time. And, and they're just there. Yeah. And so that makes that I like that idea. They also have a, a moment where they do mention that these two will eat human fe- eat human flesh if either starved or given the reason to. Because one person is threatened to be fed to them. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, they're like domestic beetles. That was my assumption is it's, it's not so much that they are, you know, turn predatory like the clover lice, but... Yeah. If you starve them. Yeah, if, if there's nothing else, if there's no kaiju to eat, I'll, I'll eat something. Gotta eat something. Now, there was one really interesting note that they make with the kaiju in Pacific Rim. And this one's interesting because it also applies to Clover and the fact that they talk about the atmospheric needs of the kaiju versus their home. And that's going from down deep to suddenly breathing thin air would be or, or, you know, what would to you be extremely thick oxygen rich air would be very, very drastic. They mention this because the kaiju in Pacific Rim are said to have made a previous attempt to take over Earth 65 million years ago when they wiped out the dinosaurs. I love that the dinosaurs serve as this benchmark. Yes. As it well, and it and it really does tie into this public popular perception of dinosaurs as monstrous creatures. That how do you make an animal or a creature seem super awesome and terrifying? Well, you have them defeat the dinosaurs. Absolutely. And that this isn't the only movie that has done this, no. where they like these wiped out the dinosaurs. Reign of Fire has a line in there about how. The dragons in Reign of Fire are the ones that did it. Yep. Uh, didn't Transformers do that? Was there a thing in Transformers about it? There, I did not watch that Transformers movie, so I cannot say. I think I there was know. a connection. Uh, but but there are other movies that have done it. Yeah. And yeah, that's and, and also the, the the implication that that could have happened and we wouldn't have noticed it in the fossil re- like it's just, it's this very it's a fun little concept. That completely undermines 40 years worth of dedicated scientific research. Like we're still just grasping at straws for what killed these animals. Which is still a very popular thought it I've is. noticed in people is this question. And we mentioned this when we talked about this in episode five. That be- I guess because the debate was so publicly touted for so long, it's still stuck in everyone's mind that people will ask, oh, what do you think was the thing that we, well we pretty much know what yeah. happened at that it's not like another contender is going to come up suddenly and we're going to change everything i i think it was the thing that killed them that yeah been... there's like two <laughs> options here and we know what they are and it but that's still a very common trope in films that builds off of this public misperception and i think part of that misperception is that because it is such a popular topic of research it makes it feel like we're still looking for the answer when we're not we're refining the answer yeah we're looking for the details of it but that's not how it sounds when when every time it comes out the news source goes new information on what killed the dinosaur that makes it sound like we're still we're still looking for the killer but we're narrowing in on them yeah no we we know who the killer is this is it's the same reason we still talk about you know ted bundy and other suit because that it's a ridiculously crazy topic that we want to know every detail of because it's so outrageous so yeah there's a little bit of that i do find interesting they make a comment on the fact that the atmosphere at that time was different from now and that it was not ideal enough for them to come in occupy earth so they came back and waited and monitored us and they say that we then, our effects on the ecosystem, made it tolerable for them. Yes, I really like that concept. Little disappointed 
that they they because he mentions what well, he says polluted ocean waters mm-hmm. and the the ozone layer depletion and they're like a sentence away from saying also dramatically increased climate change but they <laughs> don't say it i'm like all right you were so close pacific rim come on over we were this close to greatness <laughs> it's it's interesting what they what they touch on with this film and there's lots more that can be talked about there's a whole bunch of things that could be said about the biology of each kaiju but honestly that's just too much that's too much to take on uh the one thing i will mention is there's one moment where one of the kaiju turns out to be pregnant and it has an umbilical cord yes it does which is cool it's a it's a it's a true internal uh a birth animal yeah very mammalian very mammalian even though they're all drawn reptilian except for one that's drawn like an arthropod so they've got lots of cool stuff but as usual we talk about the science i would like to talk a little bit about the scientists because while there are no scientists in cloverfield at least none that we get to meet and talk to there's a whole bunch of people in white hazmat things (laughs) to be science e but they never say anything that's scientific we have two scientists in Pacific Rim, and boy, oh boy, oh man, there's a lot to talk about with them. They are among the tropiest. Now, again, Pacific Rim, that's kind of the point of Pacific Rim. Absolutely. They are supposed to be tropey, and they're fun. Like, the military people are tropey military people, and the main character is tropey main action guy. Mm-hmm. And there's another action guy who doesn't like the main action guy, and they get they get into a fight over nothing, and then it turns out that, oh, we have to work together, so we're going to be okay. And it the whole thing is, it's, it's a movie about giant robots fighting big monsters. There's not supposed to be a ton of depth to all the characters... In the way you might expect from a movie that's more dramatically focused or something. So it's totally reasonable to to say that the scientists are just like the most one note, <laughs> stereotypical, ridiculous scientist movie characters. So there's two. Yep. There's the biologist. Yep. Who is Newton Giesler or Newt, who is basically a comic book geek yeah and he talks like a like so so this is a very science movie a movie scientist trope is that socially awkward super eccentric overly excited and 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 about the stuff that they're into and he is coded very much comic book collector absolutely when he sees uh uh, hannibal chow is that his name Mm -hmm. ron perlman yes when he sees their lab or whatever, he st- he says, "Do you have this in mint condition?" In, in mint condition. <laughs> it's a what is it? A uh, it's a a, a, a one cuticle, of, I think. Yeah, is that a, cuticle in mint in condition? Mint condition. He talks like like a super nerd, like yep. a, a dorky again. And this is the the trope. This person who's obsessed with collecting and 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 cataloging these things like toys or books. The other scientist calls him a kaiju groupie. Yes, which is very much how he is. Absolutely. And then the other guy, whose name is... Herman Gottlieb. Is sort of the opposite, because he's British or Western European yes. kind of, and he's stuffy and he's very proper, and but he, he doesn't like any nonsense. He's your typical elbow pad wearing uh, mathematician. Yes, he's professorial to an extreme extent, and he's always, like, wiping. He has this handkerchief, and he has to be cleanly. Absolutely. And it's, they're two very classic, both socially awkward, both super eccentric, both obsessed obsessed with the thing that they study, scientist characters. And the thing I found interesting about how they portrayed them is, while Newt is a biologist, and Gottlieb is a mathematician, they are completely at odds with one another. They they yes. both, it's as if they both want to completely discredit the other's research for their own whilst they are both studying the same thing. Yes, it, it elevates that notion of scientific disagreement. And, and academic competition. Yes, that, that they are... 
at odds with one another. They're rivals because I, I'm the smartest person in the room. And no, your smartness is dumb. Well, they also do the thing where they outright dismiss each other. Like, yes. Herman says something at one point. He's like, the numbers don't lie. The numbers have to be, they, they are 100% accurate. He's... <laughs> numbers are as close as we get to the words of god yes he says that <laughs> and then he, he they're totally dismissive of each other in a way that yes there are eccentric personalities in science absolutely and in a post-apocalyptic world it's reasonable to presume that maybe this is all that's left <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> you, you can't survive unless you're a trope yeah exactly but it's very sort of again sort of this old school public perception of the the quintessential sciencey person whereas in reality scientists are more like the two nerds talking into this this microphone there's absolutely you know we do get excited about stuff and we are hyper focused at times yep but we also don't argue with each other over every single thing just because <laughs> We decide to study something in a different way. Like, yes, there have been rivalries. We've talked about those on yeah, the podcast. Episode fifty-eight. So that those exist, but those are also now the more popular examples. Yeah. Newt also does the classic science scientist in the movie thing of testing his experiment on himself. Yes. Of <laughs> I have this hypothesis, and everyone disagrees with me, not because they say it won't work, but because they say it's too dangerous. I say, I'll show you. I'll show all of them. And that it is too dangerous and works. Yeah. And it's one of those, I told you, none of us said either of those things were untrue. <laughs> we didn't say it wouldn't work. We said it would kill you. And then it almost did. Twice. Yes. It almost kills him in two different ways. Yep. <laughs> and so he's got that. They both in different fields of scientists are the lone people who on only they see the truth of their science. Yep. Only Newt realizes that the organs are important for understanding the kaiju, and only Herman understands that the mathematics will tell them when to expect the next increase in kaiju events. And only they know, and everyone else... You know, there's one point where one of them says to Herman, you know, I, I need facts, not numbers or something to that extent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is just like, shut up, <laughs> you stupid military man. It's you. You don't know what you're talking about if you're saying stuff like that. It's just they are utterly ridiculous. And it, they're meant to be. Absolutely. But they, they are. are just classic scientist movie tropes. And as you said, that's what they're supposed to be. So this is not a criticism. It's just an observation. Oh, yeah. Now, it definitely, they do the movie scientist trope thing, which is always my, one of my biggest pet peeves, because I think it is what confuses so many people about scientists, is that they instantly understand things as soon as they are given any amount of information. Yes, and what they say is then the facts of is the movie true instantly yep. you know they instantly know how to get through the portal once they do the experiment that gives them some information yep. uh they you know th there's tons of times where they are explaining things and they have no reason like there's no reason you should know that with what you've been talking about you're working on so it's Another science trope that, that you are, the scientist is used as exposition. You are, you are the well of knowledge. Yep. And whatever you say is fact. Is law. Which is not how it works. <laughs> if we say something wrong, we are wrong. Yes. They're just as wrong as anybody else. <laughs> and so that's, it, and all, basically all the kaiju movies do this. This is something that I have yet to see a kaiju movie do, except for a little bit in the first Godzilla where he is willing to say, I'm not, not willing to make further uh, uh, comments on this without, you know, further observation. So it, this is, that's something that it's kind of hard to have that in a big monster because you need to explain what's going on. And yeah. I get that. And again, movie, movie wise, totally understandable. And that's why they're tropes. Absolutely. It is. I've said absolutely way too many this times. this episode. Absolutely. So to go ahead and wrap up, 
our intermission episode, we will still end it with some mini rants. Because they're fun. Because they're fun. And there's always that one thing where it's just, I don't, there's nothing technical I have to say here, but what? And so, David, what's your what moment? My mini rant, if I may, if I may get a little ranty. So, Pacific, there's a point in the movie where the annoying scientist number one (laughs) comments... Oh, because he's looking for brains. He's trying to get to the brain, and they say you can't get fresh brain material from the skull because the skull's so thick, by the time you cut through it, it has already started to rot. And so he suggests that, well, why, instead of going for the, the head brain, we'll go for the brain in the hip region. The hind brain. The hind brain, which doesn't exist. <laughs> so this is an old, I don't remember, I don't know the story behind this. But there was a suggestion at some point in the past that dinosaurs were so big that a single brain couldn't control the whole body effectively. So they must have had a cluster of nerves in the back, usually described as being by the hips. That was their hind brain. And indeed, in the movie, Newt says they have two brains, like a dinosaur. Now... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> first of all that's not true that's not how it works not even a little not bit. even a little bit that's you can have involuntary reactions to things you don't need hind brains when i i love it because the few animals who do have nerve clusters throughout the body are teeny tiny arthropods insects do it because their <laughs> nervous system works differently <laughs> no no vertebrate does that and it's one of the it, it is so it's wrong and it spreads the wrongness to the world but it's also part of this consistent con- re- re- recurring trope, particularly with kaiju, is these are big, scary movie monsters. So when looking for inspiration for them, filmmakers tend to draw on big, scary monsters from the real world. And dinosaurs have always, always filled this niche, this this image of real world monsters and so kaiju and giant and movie monsters are constantly pulling inspiration from dinosaurs because that's sort of the how we've come to under to to imagine them even the wrong stuff which means that all these old misconceptions about dinosaurs end up becoming common features in movie monsters to the point that kaiju now act as this sort of these refugia (laughs) for old ideas about dinosaurs like dinosaur shaped kaiju like godzilla often stand up straight with their tails dragging on the ground which is an old idea of dinosaurs so kaiju are like these time capsules of incorrect ideas about dinosaurs that keep getting assimilated uh, yeah, that's definitely true. They they because they're so ridiculous, it, it's kind of considered okay just to throw any explanation at the wall and out of date dinosaur stuff is the one. It's the same thing that other science stuff does with well, we only use ten percent of our brain. Yeah. First off, that's not true, and that was never said. No. But that's how it was interpreted by people who don't know how to read. <laughs> And then it became... And now they have spread that misinterpreted version of it (laughs) into multiple movies. And it's the same exact concept, but with dinosaurs of just the the barest of awareness of dinosaur science so that only those things stick out enough. It perpetuates and is now the legacy is carried on by Kaiju. And it's... I like the the comparison to a refugia. That's very apt. What's your mini rant? My mini rant is, and this has been said by many, a, you know, big animal movie. But there's one particular moment in Cloverfield where toward the end of the movie, they have crashed out of a helicopter and survived relatively unscathed. Because of the plot, plot armor. And then suddenly notice Clover (laughs) standing behind them. And this happens in a number of other kaiju films, and we'll get to some of them a little bit, but like, how? How did you sneak up on him? How did you sneak up? Now, yes, 
I know there are some people out there who might be saying right now, well, elephants are actually extremely quiet, which is true. true. They are. And there's a couple reasons for that. One, they have pads on their feet. Sure do. They are walking around on effectively Jordan airs. They also can spread their weight out among four limbs. And so they are not tiptoeing around. They are taking their time and they don't move quickly. Typically, they move very slow and steady. Also, it's easy to... Elephants sneak up on people in the forest. Yes, or at night. Or at night. How many people have been snuck up by an elephant... Snuck up on by an elephant in the savannah? In broad daylight. It's just, how... First, how did you not just notice it? Shadow, at least. Oh, yeah. But when we have been hearing it stomp around the the city... Yes. It's the same thing people bring up with the T-Rex at the end of Jurassic Park. Yep. But here, even more so. <laughs> well, and they do it in Pacific Rim, too. Mm-hmm. There's the scene where Gypsy Danger and the Russian one, uh, Cherno, Cherno, Alpha. Cherno Alpha, are fighting Leatherback. Yep. And then, oh boy, what's his name? Otachi. Otachi comes leaping out of the water suddenly. Yep. Now, you might say, oh, but it's underwater. and it's e-. Right, but they're all standing in the water. Also... The entire movie, they've been tracking everything. Yep. And radio, they stay in radio contact with them through the interdimensional portal. Yep. And yet no one said, hey, it's behind you. How, they, 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 they're, they, they sneak up on people. And obviously the explanation is it's, it's a movie. It's storytelling. Yeah. It's, I wanted it to surprise them there. I didn't want them to be surprised in other. But with Cloverfield, there's just no explanation given. It's just completely, they all of a sudden, one of them goes, oh, and then they turn around and it's just standing there. Right there. Also, the planes are flying into the city, dropping more bombs like hundreds of feet away from where the monster is. And which, once again, how do you not know where the monster is? (laughs) Yeah. If Google Maps can show me my house, (laughs) I'm pretty sure we can track a giant kaiju in New York. (laughs) It's sneaky giant monsters. Stop it. That doesn't make sense. That's I don't want them to be sneaky. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> well, that's going to wrap up episode three. So we will close the discussion for now and open it back up in our more thoughts, which will be available to all you on Patreon. Yes. So go check it out there. There we will discuss a little bit more about what we think about these movies as movies. And for everyone else, either go check those out by signing up on Patreon, or next week, episode four will be coming out where we will return to some of our kaiju films from more traditional episodes and discuss them further. Yes, before the intermission, we talked about the origins of our two-star kaiju. Mm -hmm. Starting with episode four, we will talk about the more modern incarnations. Bring it into the, the modern day. With our gorilla friend... Again, next time, finishing up on episode five with the latest rendition of our old friend Gojira. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Indeed. We'll see you then. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.